Bona tarda. Good afternoon, professor Michael Meadows, president de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional. Boas tardes, professor Rubén Lois, vicepresident de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional i catedràtic de Geografia de la Universitat de Santiago de Compostela. Bona tarda, Oriol Nelo, membre numerari de l'IEC, delegat de la Societat Catalana de Geografia. Bona tarda, Rafael Jiménez Capdevila, president de la Societat Catalana de Geografia. Bona tarda, Joaquim Farguell, secretari de la Societat Catalana de Geografia. Bona tarda als antics president i presidenta i bona tarda també a tots els presents i les persones que estan connectades a través de Zoom. En nom de l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans i en el meu propi, sigueu benvingudes i benvinguts a aquesta sessió extraordinària a la que avui ens convida la Societat Catalana de Geografia, que ens convoca per escoltar una conferència. Si no diem res més, pensaríem que és una activitat ordinària, ja que la celebració de conferències, abans del Covid en format presencial, després en format virtual, ara amb aquest format híbrid, la celebració de conferències, deia, forma part de la programació regular de la societat. Però la sessió d'avui és extraordinària. És la primera vegada que el president en exercici de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional, una institució centenària que es va crear l'any 1922, és la primera vegada que el president en exercici fa una visita a la Societat Catalana de Geografia, institució octogenària que es va crear l'any 1935 i la Societat Catalana de Geografia forma part de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional a través del Comitè Espanyol. La sessió d'avui, per tant, és extraordinària. Un dels valors en què es fonamenta l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans és l'obertura, entesa com a projecció a la societat i al món des de la pròpia identitat, identitat que ve marcada sobretot per la catalanitat. I la projecció, aquest valor, la projecció és també un dels eixos prioritaris d'actuació de l'Institut per al període 2021-2025 amb un èmfasi especial en divulgació i difusió del coneixement i en enfortiment de les relacions exteriors. L'acte que avui ha organitzat la Societat Catalana de Geografia, aquesta societat que té com a objectiu el conreu de la geografia, encaixa de ple amb aquest valor i aquest eix estratègic de projecció en termes de divulgació i difusió del coneixement i d'enfortiment de les relacions exteriors, en aquest cas amb l'organisme de referència d'abast mundial. Professor Meadows, moltes gràcies per la seva visita. Per l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans és un honor acollir avui aquest acte i comptar amb la seva presència i la seva conferència per oferir-nos una perspectiva des de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional, he començat pel subtítol, de la, ara sí, el títol, Geografia en l'Antropocè. Abans d'escoltar el professor Medus, intervindran el president de la Societat Catalana de Geografia, el delegat de l'IEC a la Societat Catalana de Geografia i el secretari que farà la presentació del conferenciant. Té la paraula, en primer lloc, el president de la Societat Catalana de Geografia, Rafael Jiménez. Moltes gràcies, vicepresidenta, delegat Oriol Nelo, secretari també de la Societat Quim Farguell i primeres salutacions a tots el professor Midous, també el vicepresident Rubén Lois. I també permeteu-me que saludi el president d'Eurogeo, Rafael de Miguel, que també ens acompanya avui. I això em permet una precisió, perquè veig que hi ha hagut bastantes confusions entre Eugeo, Eurogeo i Lugi. Són diferents instàncies geogràfiques internacionals que agrupen diferents col·lectius. Eurogeo, i que tenim aquí també el seu president, agrupa geògrafs de tota Europa i amb una vocació molt dedicada a l'ensenyament de la geografia. Eugeo és l'Associació Europea de Societats Geogràfiques, de la qual la Societat Catalana de Geografia n'és membre, i que al setembre de l'any que ve, de l'any 2023, organitzarem aquí a Barcelona el seu novè congrés, un congrés que es fa cada dos anys i que l'organitzarem aquí a Barcelona. Aquest és el de l'Eugeo. 
I, a més a més, tenim avui el president de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional, el professor Midous, que ha visitat Barcelona per primera vegada com a president d'aquesta Unió Geogràfica Internacional i és voluntat de la nostra societat d'acostar-nos-hi més directament. Des de fa ja bastants anys ens formem part del Comitè Espanyol de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional, perquè històricament s'ha organitzat a través de comitès que en diuen nacionals, però que de fet són comitès estatals, i nosaltres voldríem una participació més directa des de la geografia catalana, i avui n'hem estat parlant, i segurament a través d'alguna figura d'associat, de membre associat, es podrà fer en els propers mesos. Bé, a part d'aquesta qüestió més institucional, el que sí que hi ha, com es pot comprovar per aquest acte, és una relació estreta amb la Unió Geogràfica Internacional que a més a més es tradueix perquè en el proper congrés que tindrà lloc a París el mes de juliol d'aquest any, Congrés Internacional de Geografia, serà el congrés del centenari de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional i per això es fa a París, perquè també s'hi va fer el primer, i en aquest congrés hi haurà una nodrida representació de la societat i de la geografia catalana, i per tant ja hi participem. Però no només hi participarem presencialment, amb la nostra participació a partir de ponències, etcètera, sinó també amb un text que presenta la geografia catalana, que ha redactat en Valerià Paul a partir de les contribucions que es van fer en el llibre que van publicar l'any passat de la nova geografia de la Catalunya post-Covid i que jo també he ajudat a redactar-lo i que es diu Catalan Geography in Times of Crisis. Aquest text es publicarà en anglès, en català i en castellà a les contribucions espanyoles del Congrés de París i, per tant, aviat el podreu llegir. El que passa és que, com a socis de la societat, tots heu rebut el llibre i, per tant, no us aportarà res de nou, però sí que és la versió anglesa i castellana que permetrà arribar molt més lluny. I, per tant, això és tot. Moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies. Té la paraula ara Oriol Nelo, membre numerari de l'IEC i delegat de la Societat Catalana de Geografia. Moltes gràcies, Maria. Bona tarda a tots. Just a few words to put our guests today in context about where we are and what's the meaning of this meeting. We are in the Institute of Studies Catalans. This is the National Academy of Sciences for Catalonia. The Institute was founded in early 20th century in one of the few periods in which uh, Catalonia enjoyed uh, political autonomy during the last century. Uh, it has been a long history, but a, a complex one. Uh, the Institute had to go underground during the Francoist period, uh, and it took the activities in the, in the 1970s. The Institute is made up of five sections and 125 members, elected members. The most visible section is the one working on philology, on linguistic matters. It's very important for us because it's the authority for the norms, the grammar, the lexicography, the, 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 the orthography of Catalan language. We geographers belong to, this, uh, to another section not less relevant, uh, which is the, the section of uh, philosophy and social sciences. Uh, there are some six or seven geographers between full members and emeritus members. Some of them are here with us today. Um, together with us, the Institute has some 30 affiliate societies. These are societies that uh, develop uh, scientific uh, issues like Societe Savant, and one of them uh, is the Societat Catalana de Geografia. Between all societies uh, affiliated to, uh, to the Institute, we are some 10,000 members. So it's a, it's a very important institution, one of the most relevant, in, in scientific terms, one of the most relevant uh, in, in Catalonia. The, the Societat Catalana de Geografia was, is one of the older ones. It was founded in 1935. Uh, and uh, it has today some 500 members. 
uh, this is it. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Thank you very much for coming, and we are look very much forward to, to listen to your talk. Muchas gracias. Te hará la palabra Joaquín Farguell, secretario de la Sociedad Catalana de Geografía, que hará la presentación del conferenciante. Eh, pues muchas gracias. Eh, Rápidamente pasemos a presentar al nuestro ponent. Eh, Como ya ja hemos comentado, tenemos el honor y el privilegio de contar con un conferenciante excepcional. Michael Midos es presidente de la Unión Geográfica Internacional, pero a més a més es catedrático emèrit de la Universidad de Ciudad del Cap, a Sudáfrica, y profesor de Geografía a las universidades de Zhejiang y Nanjing de la Xina. Michael Meadows, originario de Liverpool, es va graduar a la Universidad de Sussex y es doctorado en Geografía por la Universidad de Cambridge, al Reino Unido, amb una tesis doctoral titulada Ambients passats y presentes de l'altiplà de Nica a Malawi, a l'any 1982. Poc després va treballar de professor de Geografía Física a la Universidad de Liverpool, pero cinco años más tarde va esdevenir professor y posteriormente catedràtic al Departamento de Medio Ambiente y Ciencia Geográfica de la Universidad de Ciudad del Cap, on s'hi ha estat des de 1986 i fins al 2019, moment en què ha passat a ser catedràtic emèrit. Els seus interessos en el camp de la recerca s'han centrat en l'àrea de geografia física i més especialment en tots aquells temes que fan referència als canvis ambientals durant el quaternari i sobretot als impactes geomorfològics i biogeogràfics produïts per aquests canvis, tant els naturals com els induïts per l'home. La seva recerca s'ha centrat en àrees d'estudi molt variades i distants pero localizada sobre todo, o mayoritariamente, a países africanos como Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, Botswana, Namibia, Sudáfrica y, darreramente, también a la Xina. Midos ha publicado más de 200 artículos científicos en revistas internacionales de prestigio y ha estado editor o coeditor de diversas publicaciones especiales, el que se anomenen Special Issues. Entre aquests treballs destaca la coedició de la geomorfologia de l'Àfrica del Sud, publicada en 2012, o també la coedició anomenada Geomorfologia i Societat, publicada per Springer en 2016. En aquest cas també voldria destacar el lligam que té Midos amb casa nostra, i és que durant la dècada dels anys 90 va col·laborar amb la Catedràtica de Geografia Física de la Universitat de Barcelona, la doctora Maria Sala. Durant aquest període van publicar diversos articles relacionats amb la degradació i erosió del sol en àmbits mediterranis, y que va a culminar a un libro que porta a aquest mateix títol l'any 1998, en el cual Midos fa un repàs de la degradació del sol i dels paisatges en ambients i ambients mediterranis de Sudàfrica. Midos manté un camp molt ampli d'activitats de recerca relacionades amb la geografia física i actualment col·labora en diverses universitats del Regne Unit, de França, de Alemanya i també de la Xina, on ha esdevingut professor de geografia a Zhejiang i Nanjing, com ja ja hem esmentat. Actualmente es troba coeditando una obra que portará por título Geografía de la Antropocé y que se enlaza a el título de la conferencia que nos presentará hoy y que nos demostra esta visión global y conjunta de la geografía entre la actividad humana y los cambios que se producen en el medio. Y en aquest cas una visión aportada desde la Unión Geográfica Internacional. Y dicho esto, ya ja pasará la palabra a nuestro ponent. Muy bien, doncs. Té la palabra el presidente de la Unión Geográfica Internacional, el profesor Michael Meadows. The floor is yours. Wow, that's uh, quite an introduction. Thank you, thank you so much. I, um, well, I'm a geographer, as, as is obvious, I guess, uh, and I have to say, if a geographer's uh, dream is to travel, then I'm certainly living the dream at the moment. Uh, a week ago today, I was in Paris, in France. I went subsequently to uh, Spain, to Santiago, and then yesterday, or the day before, to Portugal, and now back in Barcelona. What a wonderful experience this has been uh, for me, and I want to thank, uh, in particular, Ruben, who's been accompanying me the entire time, but of course to uh, the Society for inviting me, and uh, to the Institute for the opportunity to talk, to talk at the, in this extraordinary uh, room. What an enormous privilege this is for me. And thank you so much to everybody who's here, made the effort on a rather cool uh, spring evening. And to those of you who are watching on Zoom, uh, thank you very much for taking the time out to listen to what I have to say about something that is uh, really quite close to my research field, um, but something that I think should be close to all of us as geographers, and that is uh, the Anthropocene. And so, 
I want to start off, obviously, with uh, an introduction to the talk. That won't be too much, but I want to raise this question as to whether or not we are there yet in the Anthropocene. And I think there's a fairly obvious answer to that question, but I will answer it for you. Um, and then to look at some examples, quite a few of which I think will be familiar because they've been in the news in the last year. Uh, I've called that Footprints of the Anthropocene, uh, looking at issues around climate change, the biodiversity crisis, uh, and so on. And then, because I'm the president of the IGU, it seems appropriate to uh, say something about our possible role in studies of the Anthropocene and perhaps our uh, actions towards resolving some of the issues and then uh, some conclusions. So, firstly, let's make the point that this is a controversial and contested term in uh, many circles, not least in, in geology, but it's a term that is increasingly in use whether we like it or not, and uh, it was first uh, used in a rather uh, grey little publication, pamphlet really, um, and on the last page of the pamphlet, this Global Change newsletter, was a very short article, paragraph really, by these two guys, uh, Eugene Stormer and Paul Crutzen, both of whom fortunately uh, are no longer with us. Um, and so it started in the year 2000, and you can see what's happened, that if you explore Google Scholar and look at the number of mentions of the term Anthropocene, you'll see that those citations have grown um, exponentially. Other things that have grown exponentially probably explain why we are thinking about using this term Anthropocene in the first place, and that is if we look at uh, some 12 or so measures, if you like, of uh, global resource use you'll see that every one of them has been growing pretty much exponentially since around about 1950. And population, for example, primary energy use, water use, uh, paper production, all of those, you can read the others for yourself, have led to uh, scientists to uh, develop this term, the great acceleration that from 1950 onwards, as a result partially of population growth, but other aspects of human development that we are increasingly uh, exponentially increasing our utilization of resources with intended problems. And it's not only on the, the terrestrial part of the Earth, we also see it um, in the oceans, a term that recently coined as the blue acceleration in uh, elements um, such as marine aquaculture, uh, submarine cables, the number of submarine cables and so on, and any number of these um, elements uh, illustrated uh, exponential increase in the fairly recent past. So the question is, um, are we there yet? This is, of course, for those of you who have children probably saw the movie Shrek, or maybe you went to see it for yourself. I did. Um, it's a great movie, and Donkey at the back here spends uh, a lot of the time going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And uh, it's taking forever, the you know, in-flight movie um, or nothing. And eventually, of course, they do reach the, the land of promise. Is that true of uh, the Anthropocene? Are we there yet in that sense? Well, the question for uh, a geologist and perhaps a physical geographer like myself is uh, the Anthropocene actually identifiable uh, in the Earth's stratigraphy? The geologists would certainly like it to be so if we're going to call it and uh, develop it as a, a formal geological term. And if that's going to happen, uh, it needs to be scientifically justifiable. Um, in other words, the geological signal uh, needs to be large and very clear and distinctive, and it needs also to be useful as a formal term to the scientific community. But this is something that's been much debated, um, particularly in the geological community, um, because in order for it to be uh, formalized as a term, the International Union of Geological uh, Sciences, which is a sister organization. It's one of uh, the geo unions in the International Science Council, an important one, an important sister for us, um, needs to formally uh, approve that name. And they set up an Anthropocene working group under the chair of a professor at the University of Leicester in the UK, Jan uh, Zelazovic, who has been an incredible proponent of uh, the term Anthropocene being formally adopted by the geological uh, community. But I'm afraid to say he hasn't yet won, despite the numerous productions, uh, many, many publications arguing uh, for this. The uh, International Union of Geological Sciences, the IGUES, has not yet 
formally approved it. So as far as the geologists are concerned, we aren't there yet um, in the uh, Anthropocene. There are arguments for it. Uh, the record, although it might be very thin, um, is spatially very extensive, and it already reflects uh, substantial elapsed and probably some would say irreversible change to the Earth's system. We see examples of the Anthropocene all the time, by the way. I think that these are examples that are going to appear in the geological record in the future, not least the masks uh, that can absolutely typify the uh, current pandemic. You find them everywhere, unfortunately, in the street. They're going into landfill, and they will definitely represent an identifiable layer uh, in the stratigraphy of the Earth in the future. I'm pretty sure of that, even if it's only a two-year or a three-year uh, event. And another argument for it would be that the, the scale of change, the shift, if you like, in the, in the Earth system is, is comparable, perhaps even a greater magnitude than a previous stratigraphic transitions. But there are some arguments against it. Um, strictly speaking, it doesn't meet the uh, required standards of uh, what the geologists refer to as, a, as a, a GSSP. I don't need to go into the details of, of that at the moment, but it doesn't meet those, apparently. Um, there is this obsession, of course, with it being focused on ourselves um, in human history and speculation, really, about the future rather than geologically significant events. And some say it's inconsistent with the chronostratic, uh, chronostratigraphic naming conventions. And perhaps, and I think you might agree with this, it's driven maybe more by emotion and uh, politics than, than by science. So the answer, really, at the moment is, uh, the geologist, at least, um, have not agreed. But actually, the horse has bolted, um, or the genie is out of the bottle, because everybody is using this term Anthropocene. Does it really actually matter if the geologists uh, can't decide for themselves if the term should actually be formally adopted in the geological record? So I'll leave that uh, there for you uh, to decide, but certainly it's an, a, a term that's increasingly in, in use, and I think it's a valuable one. And so, for the next uh, few slides, I want to turn to the evidence, if you like, uh, of human impact upon the environment, the footprint as it's um, illustrated here uh, graphically. Um, we sometimes talk about the, the carbon uh, footprint, but there are many, many different elements of the way in which human development, particularly uh, in the, the modern era, from 1950s onwards, the period of the Great Acceleration, have impacted upon the Earth system problematically, as you'll no doubt see. Um, I want to read this statement it's by Carl Falk, who's a, a very eminent uh, geographer from uh, 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 Sweden in Stockholm and a recipient of the Planet and Humanity Medal by the IGU um, in 2016, that the human dominance is reflected in the weight of the current human population, which is 10 times the weight of all wild mammals so we're talking about mammals here, but nevertheless, if we add the weight of livestock for human use and consumption to the human weight, only 4% of the weight of mammals on Earth remain as wild animals, which is an extraordinary statistic in a sense. Just the 96% of everything that kind of lives and breathes in much the same way as you and I do um, is basically human or is to the service of, of humans. And then the figure above, which appears in, this, in the same paper, actually comes originally from a paper published a few years ago about what might, you might call the, the limits uh, uh, to growth, but are referred to here as the safe operating space of, of planet Earth. And you can see that in a number of instances, we're already well beyond the safe operating, operating space, and that that footprint uh, is beginning to uh, seriously threaten the operation of Earth system um, processes. And this is what the, the human footprint looks like according to the Living Planet Report from uh, 2020. That the reds obviously indicate those parts of the Earth's surface which have been, they use the term, damaged. This proportion of each of the terrestrial biomes across the planet um, that uh, are uh, in some way or other impacted to a large degree or to a lesser degree, and we might think of those areas as wilderness. And you can see that there are green spaces, some in Amazonia still, some in the Sahara, and some in uh, central parts of Australia, and in the high latitudes, and in the Himalayas, and high latitudes in North America as well. But there's a lot of red on that map, and there uh, can be no doubt that the human footprint in, uh, described in that sense is a very dominant one um, indeed. 
And so what about Spain and its human footprint? This is work that was published in 2016. Um, unfortunately, the data don't come through to the very recent past, but this was a, an effort by uh, some Australian scientists to look at the way the human footprint had changed on a national basis. So here's the data for, for Spain and a, and a part, of course, of uh, a substantial part of, of North Africa. And these are the, the estimates of that sort of developed uh, damage that was in the previous diagram, um, ecosystems, in 1993, and then um, in 2009. And they may not look terribly different, but actually, if you subtract one from the other, you get that. And that suggests that in the period between 1993 and 2009, Spain shifted many of its ecosystems in a direction which reflected increased uh, human footprint, increased human um, activity. Now, we don't, unfortunately, this study doesn't take us through to 2020 or 2022 for that matter. So, if any of you have got PhD students out there who'd like to bring this all forward to the present day. It's, uh, it's uh, a study that's crying out loud to be done. Um, but it's not a particularly pretty picture for, for Spain, and I don't know the country. Um, and by the way, Portugal is there as well, and so is Catalan, Catalonia. I don't know well enough uh, the geography of your country, but you might have some comments about why that might have been the case. And perhaps since 2009, the situation has improved. I can't say. So that's about the footprint generally. What about the climate? Well, you all know this, that the climate, in a sense, acts as the, the sort of canary in the, in the miner's cage. This technology, of course, is no, no longer in use. It's all um, automated down in the mines. But uh, 100 years ago, that's how people used to tell whether or not there was gas, uh, toxic gases in the mine. When the canary fell off the perch, the miners knew that it was time to remove themselves from the mine. And uh, I think, in a way, climate is our canary for the global um, Earth system. And the reason for it, you all know this, this is uh, high school geography, the increase in uh, carbon dioxide concentrations over time from uh, first measured formally in the late 1950s and right the way through to the present day. Not quite the present day, but I extracted the data that I could. The latest statistic I could get from NOAA was March the 27th, um, uh, just a, a three weeks ago or so. Uh, four weeks ago now, uh, and it was 420 parts per million. A year before that, it was 417 parts per million. Ten years ago, it was 395. When I was a graduate stu undergraduate student, uh, which is quite a long time ago, <laughs> admittedly, uh, in the 1970s, it was 360 parts uh, per million. So we haven't uh, got on top of this by any stretch of the imagination. And the impact of this and other things, and particularly other greenhouse gases, has been, of course, global climate change. Now, we know a lot more about this than we used to, thanks to the efforts of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, who produced this uh, enormous tome, 4,300 pages worth of it, in, uh, I think, uh, late July, early August, last year. It's all available for download if you're interested. In it. It's full of graphics, such as you see on the right-hand side. It's an incredible statement. You could call something 4,300 pages long a statement, but it is the state of the art as far as our knowledge of the climate system um, is concerned. And probably the key message here, uh, of course, is that when we model the climate without humans, we get the, quite a lot of fluctuation in global temperatures over this period from 1850 to the present day. But when we see what actually has happened as a result of uh, human interference with the climate system, particularly through greenhouse gases, but there are other elements of that as well, that we've got very, very different uh, global mean temperatures, already more than one degree warmer than it might have been expected to be given the uh, operation of the Earth system without the impact of those green greenhouse gases. And finally, the world seems to have started to take some notice of this. This is extracts from the British newspapers the day after the IPCC report, the sixth assessment report was produced. There have been five previously. And they certainly do seem to be taking notice, uh, finally, at least the front pages, uh, even of the tabloid newspapers, suggesting that we've got a problem. But of course, that was a headline on one day, and the following day it was something else, and now it's uh, COVID, pandemic, or increase, I mean, why not, of course, uh, Ukraine? That should be on our, our front pages. But it's as if we can very easily forget these things. Actually, even more recently than that, just uh, 
probably 10 days ago, the IPCC produced another volume. This time it's only 3,000 pages long, so it's easier to read from that point of view. But um, this is about climate uh, mitigation, and it's, it's, an imp it's a report that was really produced for policy makers, and there is a, a, an executive summary in there that's not quite so long, but here's the key evidence or the key message that uh, in order to deal with this problem, which we now accept is real, and the scientists are not arguing uh, much about this anymore, the skeptics have basically gone quiet because we know that the people of humans, at least, have in, impacted the climate. If we don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions across the full energy sector, it requires major transitions, including a substantial reduction in fossil fuel use. And you probably can't read that, but it's a long list of the kinds of ways in which we can, if we put our mind to it, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. And maybe if there's anything possibly good that could come out of the Ukraine war, and I'm not sure that's the right way to phrase it, but it might be that uh, most of Europe has realized, uh, most of Western Europe at least, has realized that they cannot necessarily rely on uh, fossil fuels. And we really start to, accelerate, start to think about accelerating our use of um, renewables. But the time is now to do it. And we should have been doing this a long time ago I speak, of course, as a South African, where we're still strongly reliant on coal, unfortunately, but we ought to have made decisions about that ourselves 10 years ago. We're facing the urgency now um, because our infrastructure of uh, power production is broken and we've had uh, uh, power failures in Cape Town um, at least three times today as a consequence um, of that. Now, does the rest of the world or do the politicians take any notice um, of all of this? Well, we had COP26 uh, in, I think, October uh, last year in Glasgow, where the uh, powers that me got together, well, some of them did, um, and uh, tried to thrash out um, a new climate agreement. And I'm afraid they didn't get terribly far in The Economist. You can see what they felt uh, about that situation. So we face, I think, a little bit uh, of an impasse uh, at the moment regarding all of this. I think everyone accepts that we need to do something about uh, the climate and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but there's extreme reticence on behalf of uh, some governments um, to bite the bullet, as it were, and, and, and do that. That's a pretty depressing story, uh, unfortunately, and let's hope that uh, eventually we do wake up and governments do start to really embrace the ideas. So another element of the uh, Earth system that's been strongly impacted, something that I've been working on myself uh, quite a lot since my PhD, and that is the human impact upon landforms, on geomorphology, sometimes referred to as anthropogeomorphology. And, it, and it's often sort of thought about as uh, to do with accelerated erosion, soil erosion, land degradation, and so on. And in that sense, uh, you can see in this slide, um, these accelerated erosions, these bad land areas, um, that uh, it's been a process during which human impact has caused the loss of ground. But just as much ground that's being lost is uh, these days being gained through coastal land reclamation. Uh, probably the most famous example of it all is this um, area of uh, the Middle East around, well, it is Dubai with the two palms. This thing is called the world. Well, there are now three palms, actually. There they are. Uh, extraordinary structures. It's an incredible geomorphological experiment that's taking place in that part of the world. Um, what the impact of that will be, I don't think anybody's really guessed at this stage. But, but this is not an isolated process at all, and uh, that's basically the way it, uh, uh, it, they go about it in Dubai, at least. They just um, either bring sand um, across uh, from the land, or in most cases, they're actually just dredging the sea and redistributing it again. What the impact of that is, I don't suppose anybody really cares in that part of the world because this is all being done to uh, make Dubai a more attractive place to, to visit and to work and, and to live in. But it's not an isolated process, as I said. And with colleagues um, from uh, Shanghai, we've been working in the, in, in the past to look at this process, particularly but not exclusively uh, in Asia. Uh, and a couple of paces, uh, papers here, one in remote sensing, one in science of the, of the total environment, in which we were mapping uh, these uh, land uh, extension, as it were, building beyond the land, as some would uh, call it, sometimes in palm-like structures, as you can see in, in that city. Um, and uh, looking at it uh, in a bit more detail in one or two cities, especially 
uh, Shanghai, the rate at which this is being uh, taking place. And this is Incheon, which is um, uh, South Korea or Korea Republic uh, near the airport. Very interestingly, uh, this area is very rapidly subsiding. They have an enormous problem at the airport in, in, in Incheon as a consequence of this extended land being extremely unstable stable and subject to, to shrinkage. So it hasn't been without its problems. But you can see here that it's a very prominent process um, in uh, that part of the world. And especially, as you can see in this graphic, uh, in Asia, these are the areas uh, in hectares that have been uh, reclaimed uh, since the 1980s. And it's very prominent, as you can see over here in, in Asia, particularly, but not exclusively, um, in China. Uh, these are the examples of Chinese cities that have extended their land significantly. You might be interested, of course, and you will know this, uh, that Barcelona has partic participated itself in this, in this process in what I imagine is an extension to the port. Haven't had an opportunity yet. We only arrived this morning. Uh, whether there's a chance to go and uh, visit that particular area of, of uh, land extension, I'm not sure, but uh, St. Petersburg, there's Shanghai again. But other countries um, around the world have been engaged in this. So we got to thinking about why they're doing it. I mean, obviously, it's because land is short on the land, so we're extending in order to do it. But what are the drivers uh, of this massive ecological... Sorry, well, it's, it's both an environmental, geomorphological and ecological experiment in a sense. And economic development is, is obviously one, and this may well be the, uh, the Barcelona reason. It's the extension of land for the development of industry, ports, and airports. Shanghai, uh, new airport in Shanghai, entirely built on reclaimed land, as uh, has South Korea's airport at Incheon. It's also been about commercial and residential development. And I've uh, referred this uh, uh, as the term prestige, that places like Dubai have been doing this to make them, them look more attractive for international and national, for that matter, uh, economic um, development, the construction of high-end residential properties, many of which are just occupied for just part of the year, and of course hotels and, and tourism is all wrapped up with, with that particular process. But some of it's for coastal uh, protection, and some of it actually uh, for ecological purposes, especially interesting enough, um, and you might be surprised about this, um, in China and including Shanghai, where there are quite large areas that have been reclaimed um, purely for conservation purposes. Um, China has this policy of creating an ecological civilization, and one element of that is to try and improve the uh, environment in, in coastal systems, and in some cases that has been on land which was reclaimed, and there are nature conservation areas. As regards the impacts of this, I've already hinted that I think they're largely um, unknown, but there are quite simply enormous quantities of sand being moved around the planet, uh, not only, of course, for uh, land reclamation at the coast, but for building anything, um, and this is the sort of impact that it has on site. Um, and then, well, there's been some studies in China uh, for Lake Poyang, which is um, on the uh, Yangtze uh, River system, where the... Uh, amount of sand being removed exceeds, as you can see there, 230 million cubic meters uh, per year. Has been suggested this might be a looming tragedy. Uh, this was a paper in Science just about three years ago, I think, suggesting that we've got a, a geomorphological and ecological crisis on our hands with the scale at which this is happening. And quite a lot of the sand is being moved in de the developing world in countries of the south completely illegally. There's no licensing system often. It's essentially being stolen and uh, redistributed uh, with all kinds of potential problems. So that's geomorphology, and as I said, that's something that I've been busy working with. Biodiversity is also an obvious area where there's a very strong human uh, footprint. Um, we have recently, again, just going back to the Living, Living Planet Report in 2020, the Living Planet Index between 1970 and 2016 has uh, declined by 68%. And this is, these are sort of sample populations, so it's not the whole world, but they are, uh, the average abundance of uh, more than 20,000 populations representing over 4,000 species. The populations declined by 68% over that time, and I think that's uh, clearly a time bomb 
from a biodiversity perspective. And we see it also in what's referred to here in the same study as the biodiversity intactness uh, index, in which, again, we've had uh, substantial uh, declines. And this is an estimate of how much of the original biodiversity remains on average uh, across these communities in, well, in this case, in, in the different continents. continents. It's not a pretty picture, um, and again, there needs to be, there need to be efforts um, in order to resolve this, but there are many, many challenges in terms of addressing this, uh, probably not least the fact that, again, governments are pretty reluctant to engage. Um, we have, across the board, I think, national policy responses which are suboptimal. Of course, funding will always uh, be a problem. We still, I think, don't have the knowledge of, of the distribution of biodiversity that might enable us to develop better plans and then try to persuade governments to increase uh, or improve their policies. And, well, it suggests, uh, these authors also suggest that the review processes are, are, are inadequate, inadequate. Now, all of those things, the effect of uh, humans on climate landforms and diversity, uh, biodiversity lead to an increase in hazard and risk. And we've seen this on our television screens um, within the last 12 months. Uh, you might remember these, the flooding of the Rhine probably about a year ago. I might have the dates wrong. Certainly sometime in 2021. That's um, a co the complete collapse of an area outside the town of Erfurt. Well, it's actually close to Erfurt. This isn't Erfurt itself. But nevertheless, very dramatic impact of that. Um, this is a bit lower down in Liège, um, in Belgium. Uh, not the same time exactly, but the same process. Uh, Chongqing in China, this is the Yellow River, uh, flooding in the, the Yangtze River, I beg your pardon, flooding in the middle of the, uh, the Yangtze catchment. Massive problems caused there. Um, sorry, that shouldn't say Earth for Germany, that's a misprint. That's California with the fires. Um, a little later on than that, it was probably in the summer last year. Um, we, of course, had fires in the Mediterranean Basin, famously. You may well have had some in Spain as well at that time. I'm pretty sure you did because it was very widespread across around the Mediterranean Basin. And my own town of uh, Cape Town, almost exactly a year ago today, the fire started on the Sunday, the equivalent Sunday, to the date, uh, where are we today? It's Tuesday, yeah, well, it was two or three days ago. And uh, it was a fire started probably by arson, but it was a bushfire. This is the city of Cape Town, and unfortunately, it invaded very literally, uh, spread into the campus of the University of Cape Town, and this was our special collections library, which is, if there's any li part of the library that's going to be destroyed by a fire, this is the last one you want to lose because the special collections are called special for a reason. And so they're utterly irreplaceable. Manuscripts, recordings, films, uh, documentaries, maps. Fortunately, our map collection did survive reasonably well, but both the fire damage and, of course, the subsequent water damage when they tried to put the fire out, it completely destroyed that, that library. And... Uh, I mention it because it's close to my heart, and a year ago or so we were doing helping everybody. We got volunteers from all over the world in the end to come and, and assist with the, at least the rescue operation to try and triage the, uh, the materials and try and salvage as much as we possibly could. So these are disasters, and they are on the increase, as you would probably know, uh, that if we look at, uh, this is uh, a paper by Sandrero, um, and uh, co-authors from 2020, I think, looking at the number of, broadly speaking, disasters in uh, this data is from, from Asia. You can see uh, that all three types of disaster, they're talking here about hydrological, geological, and climatic uh, disasters have all um, increased, again, probably pretty much exponentially. And it's no coincidence, I don't think, that this is the... Uh, a measure of economic development, that as we've developed more economically, so it seems in parallel with that, we've increased our risk to the kind of disasters that, uh, well, we illustrated in the previous few photographs. And so this has been theorized as well. Uh, this paper refers to the concept of an Anthropocene risk, in other words, increased risk in the Anthropocene, where you have... Uh, 
uh, the three elements of, of risk, vulnerability, the actual hazard, and exposure. So that hazard all, in a sense, winding up as a consequence of, well, global climate change and the geomorphological impacts that we spoke about and, and so on and so forth, the human, uh, the human footprint. And we see evidence of this directly in the IPCC uh, report, which in, in this case is, is modeling now um, the degree of change as we go through from uh, the, the present day, headed forward to 2050 and the end of this century. Various models, of course, in the, in the IPCC report, but changes are evident in, for example, here, the distribution of precipitation, which are predicted, predicted to take place if we have a two degrees centigrade global warming. We're not far off that now. We've already exceeded one degree. And you can see that there are winners and losers here, that uh, there are some parts of the world, like the Sahara, which might well benefit, in a way, from increased uh, moisture in the atmosphere, but there are other parts of the world, and I would point out Southern Africa, because, I'm, because I live there, uh, is not likely to do terribly well as a consequence of this, and Spain also probably, modeled at this scale, I'm not sure how reliable that would be, but it looks though that might get drier as well. And that becomes a double whammy, as the Americans would say, when you start looking at soil moisture, because we don't only have less rainfall in Southern Africa, we've got higher temperatures. You put those two things together, and we have increased drought facing us in that part of the world, which is already in a, a bit of a state as far as water resources um, are concerned. So hazard and risk in, uh, in the Anthropocene, the overall premise of this is that um, the, the risk has accelerated, that events one thought of as extreme uh, are now occurring annually or even seasonally. And we can see that again in the IPCC report, that events that used to be between 1850 and 1900 regarded as once every 10 year events, um, if we go to a two degree centigrade temperature increase, we're already just about here at one and a half, and we certainly are at one. Those uh, events, which were regarded as pretty rare once every 10 years, now occurring two to three times every 10 years. If we go to two degrees, they'll be happening every other year. Uh, so it's not surprising that these extreme events are, are on the increase. And, and so non-extreme events even um, can have catastrophic consequences because with you know, population increase, more people are exposed. And of course, society has produced its uh, own risks in terms of chemicals and nuclear weapons and you name it. And the other thing that happens, of course, is that events roll into each other. They cascade and evolve from the local scale to... The regional scale, and I'll come back to this point about vulnerability, um, but just to give you some very quick uh, examples, famously, of course, in the literature, a cascading disaster in uh, 2011 with the uh, Fukushima disaster. This is uh, the um, uh, earthquake offshore that uh, brought on the uh, tsunami onto the northeast shore of uh, China, south of, sorry, Japan, south of Sendai with these horrendous pictures of the effect directly of the tsunami and the impact and the after effects of it. Um, but then perhaps more seriously, because of the cascading effect, the problem was at Fukushima and that nuclear power station, which unfortunately went on fire and very large uh, numbers of people, 20,000 or so, at least had to be evacuated with many, many deaths as well uh, as uh, a consequence. And it's always the poor who end up uh, mostly impacted by all of this. Most of us in the affluent parts of the world, and I don't live in a particularly affluent part of the world, but I live in a very affluent part of, uh, a not particularly affluent part of the world, are protected because, well, we live in places that are perhaps a little bit more secure, and we have insurance policies that enable us that if something bad does happen, we can go to the insurance company and say, please give us some money to fix the house up. But that's not the case with people who find themselves in this situation. And in the very recent past, literally last week, We've had floods in the eastern part of South Africa uh, near Durban. I live down here in Cape Town. We saw none of this. But nevertheless, um, there are more than 400 people already known to be dead in these floods, and thousands are without forms of shelter. And just a few images. Uh, this is the main highway between two, well, Durban itself and another major city in the region, Peter Maritzburg, that cars were literally stranded. Um, this is a more formal house. Those guys are fine. They'll claim it on the insurance, um, assuming nobody, of course, was actually injured or killed in that. But this person here, maybe not so 
lucky from that point of view. Now, because you all know that, um, but it, what it speaks to me about is, and maybe I'll come back to it later, it, 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 when we're considering climate change and all of those other things about the human uh, footprint, we also have to think about inequity. We also have to think about political things. So is the IGU doing <laughs> about this? <laughs> um, well, it's not easy for a, an individual organization to address these uh, global issues, but I do think that we're trying our best to do something. We, we have, as geographers, I think, a kind of advantage uh, in all of this, to be honest with you, because we are an integrating and holistic science. We bring together in our studies the human and the physical environment, and that relationship is at the core of, our, of many of our, of our studies. And we have a long history of uh, interest in these things. Um, hazard and risk research is, we have a hazard and risk uh, commission, human impact studies. Uh, many of us have contributed to the IPCC reports. And so we're doing the kind of science that goes into understanding how the Earth system works. Remote sensing and GIS, we don't own that technology, but we're certainly good at using it. We're certainly good at interpreting the uh, results of remote sensing, and we can explore those uh, data with uh, geographical information systems very, very well and much better than we used to be able to. We have a history of looking at environmental history. So there's a kind of, the kind of benchmark studies that show us how the Earth has been changing through time before the major development of human uh, impact, as we've seen. And then, of course, landscapes at the heart of, of what a lot of us are, are interested in. And I made a, a, a statement in a paper a few years ago. It's not an original statement, but I to publish it in 2020 with that, so I can put quotation marks around it, that geography is the science of uh, or for sustainability. And as Noel Castry said in 2015, it's the discipline that reaches the parts that others cannot reach. So we have uh, some uh, advantages as a study because the physicists don't really engage in the same way with the social sciences. In fact, they don't really engage with it at all. And yet geographers do. And we do it in a way that I think properly tries to at least integrate those uh, two arms, if you like, of, of understanding the earth, the environmental and the social. So with regard to the Anthropocene, that's a lot of text, um, but I'll go through it quickly because I want to finish shortly. Uh, the Anthropocene actually is, a, in a way, a geographical concept because it involves the study of human impact on nature and varying through geographical space. So we ought to own this concept as, uh, and use it uh, and the power of, uh, uh, as a symbol of the scale of human impact, I think we, 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 cer we certainly need to be embracing it. I don't think all geographers need to do that. Um, I have to, to some extent in, in my studies, but I don't think it's for everybody. We need at the very heart of things to do good geographical studies that don't necessarily always have to involve the human impact and the Anthropocene and the, social, the sustainable development goals and so on. But we need to do this in such a way that does not view society as an add-on to environmental science or the study of the environment. We need to do it in a way that truly integrates the society and the social into the physical. And I think we are in a new unique position as geographers uh, to do that. Um, as it says here, you probably read this already, that uh, we can't simply view society as a, another column in the bookmaking of the big corporations. That's not my phrase, but I've... Uh, attributed to those two authors. So we need to embrace multiple representations of the human environment relationship and of uh, the Anthropocene. It's also a, con a context, I think, which has relevance to the humanities as well as to the social and the natural sciences. And we need to recognize that landscapes are actually combined social <coughs> biophysical entities. They represent power relations, they represent colonialism, and as much as they represent things like hydrology and geomorphology and climate and biodiversity and, and so on. So I'm nearly at the end, but I did want to make an advertisement for the IGU. Uh, we have some 43 commissions. I'm sure you'll find something of interest here somewhere. Uh, it may not represent every single corner of geography, but we're pretty broad as a church, and uh, we've got quite a lot that deal with uh, sustainability issues in particular, 
and some directly with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I highlight uh, these ones. We have a, a, a commission on geography for future Earth. We have one on global change and human mobility. We have land use and land cover change, sustainability of rural systems. Uh, Paul, Paul Valencia is, um, sorry, Paul, the name's gone, but Professor Paul. Thank you, Valeria, not Valencia. Um, but I'm back in Spain, so you can forgive me. Uh, has just won our Commission uh, Excellence Award, um, and that'll be announced shortly. So it's advanced news for, for some of you. Water sustainability, global understanding, hazard and risk is there, geomorphology and society. So we're doing things in science which have something directly to do with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I must not forget, I didn't put it here, but I cannot forget gender because that is one of the Sustainable Development Goals as well, Maria Dolores. Um, but it, just make it my list last week when I was compiling it. I didn't know I was going to meet you. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's just a snapshot. And so by way of uh, some conclusions one by one. So, uh, this goes without saying that there's an increasing scale of human impact pushing the planetary boundaries. The response is needed increasingly urgently, and we're probably a stuck records as, uh, as professors telling this uh, a story. But when will that response actually happen? When will the governments, because they have to make the big decisions, really decide to embrace this? And the distractions of, uh, I mean, it's not really a distraction because it arises out of the footprint of the, um, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It kind of deflects people's attention. They don't see that necessarily as a consequence of the human impact upon the environment, but actually it is just as much as accelerated soil erosion is. And, and so we really have an urgent need to do this. Uh, we need good science, and I hope that uh, geographers are always doing good science to try and improve our scient scientific understanding of processes. But we need to integrate the science with uh, particularly the sustainable development goals. It's not everybody's idea of fun, that. Um, but I think it is important. The SDGs are, are with us, and it is a way, definitely, of geographers engaging with reality um, uh, globally uh, towards transformation. And this is the point I was wanting to make earlier, that we can't do any of this unless we... And I say we, the IGU can't uh, directly involve it, but these inequities that... that, that distribution of wealth uh, and, and power is so hopelessly imbalanced in the world, it's particularly in my country in South Africa, it's absolutely desperate. Um, I, you know, as an individual, I don't know how to do that. I can vote for a, another party that might do better at resolving some of those inequities, but at least let's own up to the fact that this is way more of a tragedy for, for, uh, for the poor and the vulnerable than it is for, for most of us. Um, so geography is uh, some kind of intellectual solution, if not a practical solution, because it is a discipline that integrates the natural and the human sciences. So I would encourage, uh, I know many of you, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, to engage with the IGU commissions. We have representatives here from several of them. Um, but it is a way, at least, of talking to each other across national, transnational boundaries, uh, and learning from each other, and that to me is absolutely fundamental if we're going to make some progress in all of this. And we can't re wait for governments to respond. We need uh, bottom-up approaches, and we actually also need to make some decisions ourselves as individuals and embrace those. I'm not a very good example of that since I've flown halfway around the world to talk to you uh, and no doubt added a few tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere in the process. Uh, but nevertheless, our own behaviours, um, I think, do have some relevance here. Bottom-up approaches are, are uh, important. And the question is, can it be done? So my last two slides are technical again, um, because I was involved in a study uh, at the beginning of 2021, um, looking at data from 2020, when China locked down completely. Quite a lot of it's locked down at the moment, uh, actually, but it did lock down nationally um, in early January in, in 2020. And so uh, this uh, particular uh, pair of, of graphics show the concentrations of uh, an industrial pollutant, nitrogen uh, dioxide, in the atmosphere before and after the lockdown. So actually, um, air pollution 
uh, can be reduced if we take it seriously enough. I mean, this is a pretty dramatic thing to do, to lock down the economy of an entire country for a few weeks. But we can make an impact on the global climate, at least, uh, if we adopt the right decisions and adopt them quickly. And a follow-on study that I was uh, personally involved with a long list of authors published in Science Advances um, last year, looked at the impact of the reduction in mobility of people, not traveling, as again, data from China. This is all mobile phone data, by the way. Uh, the Chinese state knows where everybody is at any time of the day or night because they have their cell phone records. Um, whether you like that or not, um, it does enable these kinds of data to be produced. And obviously people had to stay behind. They weren't going to work. They weren't traveling between um, uh, cities as they would have done because it was Chinese New Year around about this time. And the impact of that actually was to produce a, a spring um, in 2020 that was greener across uh, the whole of Africa, sorry, China, um, it came something like eight to 10 days earlier than it had done in the previous uh, 20 years or so, and it was considerably greener as a consequence. So it is possible for decisions to be taken which will have an immediate impact. And so I think there's a lesson here that if we take these issues seriously, it is possible for governments to take decisions and make decisions that will have a positive impact on the global environment. So with that, I will finish and encourage you to come to Paris um, in July if you need any encouragement. We'll be there celebrating 100 years of uh, the IGU, and uh, I hope to see as many of you as possible um, in Paris to celebrate that enormous occasion. So with that, I will say in Catalan, uh, moltes gracias a todos. Moltes gràcies al professor Medeus per la seva intervenció. Tenim ara uns minuts per torn obert de paraules, sigui en format presencial o, si ens avisen des del final, si hi ha alguna intervenció en format virtual, doncs també podrà plantejar les observacions o comentaris que es vulgui. Gràcies. Gràcies molt, professor Medeus. Va ser, com és usual, una gran inspiració your speech, we really thank your, your speech. Well, let me say you something. Uh, in Spain, we have approved this week the, well, I'm, going, I'm speaking about my issue about education, geographical education, as you can guess. We have approved the national curriculum of uh, higher, uh, of, of, um, of high schools, uh, upper, upper schools, so uh, key 10 and key, key 10, key 11, key 12, this is 700 pages, but last week we approved also middle schools, so lower secondary education, key seven, nine, and 10, so another seven pages of national curriculum. This is about 1,500 pages of curriculum and not a single word on Anthropocene. <laughs> but let me say, this is not the exception because the national standards are the U United States with the National Geographic or in France or in Germany, we know very well what it's happening in the European curriculums, so there's no word on the Anthropocene. There are some exceptions like Finland or maybe the new guidelines of the UK. So my point is, well, it's not at the same time a question and a reflection. So, uh, because uh, previously, uh, well, Anthropocene, I think it, it should be a key word for any national curriculum in geography education, mostly in secondary education. And uh, previously there weren't uh, Keywords like uh, sustainable development goals or urban segregation or, for example, circular economy. But now, nowadays, they, they take part of our curriculum, and this is very important for our children to grow and to know the environment. So the question is, is Anthropocena, let's say, uh, ivory tower, academy, circle concept? Because it's not even uh, very well known in the media, in the common language. So how can we do uh, IU or EURGEO or uh, national geographical societies in order to promote and disseminate this concept in order to raise awareness that we live in a different, in a different age, a different era? So mm. as Anthropocene, I, I think it's important yeah. key. So our students, they don't know a word about what Anthropocene is and they go further to the, to, to the adult life or the university or higher education without knowing this key concept to understand the world. Yeah, it's, uh, what you said is rather uh, disturbing. I, it's a, if it's a new curriculum, I would have anticipated that there 
at least the word would have been there. Um, it's not necessarily an absolute tragedy if there is at least elements of that curriculum which uh, deal with the kinds of issues around the human footprint. Um, is it all just descriptive geography or is there some kind of reflection on the degree to which humans have impacted upon the environment? Because if that's there, then the word anthropocene, which I personally argue is a very, very useful symbol of human activity, even if the geologists can't make their minds up. So it's kind of an icon, as a word, for, for human impact. And if it's not there, at least are there elements of the curriculum which recognize uh, things like climate change and, and biodiversity. Maybe they don't use the word crisis, but the impact of humans on biodiversity and accelerated soil erosion, all of those. I would like to think that I'm sure they are there, even if the word itself um, is not used. But I think looking, and I don't know if it's just an ivory tower. I mean, we've had, well, maybe The Economist is also ivory tower. <laughs> but they've been front page, it's been front page headlines, uh, front page cover of The Economist. I've sometimes used that cover in, in lectures. Um, all we can do, I think, as, as university uh, teachers and teaching teachers of the next generation is, is to use the concept, um, embrace it, as I've suggested, and hope that it does trickle down into, into the curriculum. And that, uh, because if that doesn't happen, the next generation that comes through, and it's not only in geography that this word is needs to be used, because a lot of politicians never did geography at school, and they would never hear, hear of it if they only, you know, we confined it to the, the discipline. It needs to be across the curriculum. Sounds like it isn't. Uh, hello. I, I, I just want to say that we are changing the curriculum and uh, every uh, comunidad autónoma, so Catalonia and Aragon and Andalusia, etc., they, they are making a part of the curriculum. So I, I would like to say that in, in September, the new curriculum for high school, so the students of 17 years old before university, they will have a concept uh, obligatory that it's, it's anthropogen, um, um, anthropocene geography. Yeah? So it will be in the curriculum from September on, I hope. So for now it is in, in the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So that's Catalan, that's Catalonian. It's the Catalan concretion. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, it's every every community can finish the curriculum. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Well, first of all, uh, Professor Meadows, thanks so much for your presentation and the points that you raise. Uh, with the concept of Anthropocene, there is also the critique sometimes that the concept itself can hide the fact that not all humans had contributed to the situation in which we are now. And that's something that uh, it's part of the debate. And I think the concept is interesting, but that pointing out this element is also relevant. Uh, but my question uh, is uh, what you point out and what we show and what we know shows uh, and calls for the need of a complete paradigm shift. And after the COVID and after all what, we, uh, what you show and the facts, it seems that we didn't learn anything. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, I think things accelerate in the wrong direction. So taking advantage that you are here as the president of the International Geographical Union, you had mentioned geography is very well positioned. Yet, I think, what do you think about the need to make a call from a transdisciplinary coalition Geography has a lot of potential, but geography itself probably cannot do it. So what do you think about the effort to take into account the need to join efforts with a lot of different disciplines in order to kind of try to engage, try to push this, this huge uh, transformation, uh, yeah. paradigm shift, which is a huge challenge. Yeah, I agree. And by the way, I totally agree with you regarding the... Well, I mentioned right at the outset there's a contested form, and, I, and then I, I distilled that down into the arguments that the geologists are having, which are probably irrelevant, actually, in, except among the ivory tower. Um, but there is an argument, of course, and a contestation and a critique uh, 
that, as you rightly point out, it's, it, it's not everybody. And the people in the receiving end of the kind of uh, processes that we've set in motion um, are not those who've created this in, in, in the first place. So the, the concept needs to, uh, to be broad enough to recognize that, um, and that it needs to be considered not just a kind of scientific ideal, um, but one that deals with very closely, uh, very fundamentally with this relationship between people and society, and that that relationship is uneven in different parts of the world. It's inequitable in terms of the causes as well as, as the effects. So, so thank you for that point. And so, yeah, I, I, I obviously like the idea of, uh, of activism around, um, uh, around this. Um, and we should support uh, activists who are at the forefront of trying to persuade governments in a much more direct way. And I would uh, obviously mention uh, Greta Thunberg in particular uh, and her, you know, the school strikes that she got started a few years ago and that uh, continued to do so. And we need to embrace those uh, movements um, environmentally. And there is, of course, the concept of ecocide. Um, and there are organizations which are, are promoting that, that it should be actually an illegal activity uh, it should be illegal, in other words, that uh, things which damage the earth should be regarded not just as, as something that to be fixed by governments, but that uh, individual corporations should be taking responsibility and paying, as it were, for the damage that, uh, that they're causing. So I'm not sure that answers your question about what geographers can do, but we can encourage our students, definitely, to become. Not all of them will want to be activists. Not everybody wants to be out there waving the banners. But the more people that do that, the more pressure we can put on governments to whether or not it's a full paradigm shift or if it just slow, for, for now at least, just slowing the inexorable, well, progress is the wrong word, but acceleration uh, of, uh, well, greenhouse gas production uh, for a start. Good point. I, I don't have an individual solution, but encouraging activism around it among our students, I think is a good thing to do. And showing them that there is this, and they should be, we should be angry about it. I mentioned this in the talk yesterday. There was so much fuss about Will Smith's punching that uh, guy on the stage at the Oscars. It was absolutely on every, I don't know where it was here, but it was all over the newspapers and the press for about a week, actually. The same day in which that happened, or the night in which that happened, we produced data from Antarctica, the scientists produced data from Antarctica, to show that the, the temperature in March was 22 degrees higher than it had ever been in the, in the, in the history of uh, temperature in Antarctica. That's what we should be angry about. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, have, um, we have one question from our virtual audience, from our audience from online. Um, the question is, um, done by Masia Vlazquez from the University of the Balearic Islands. And he asks, would you trust in alleviating inequalities democratically yeah. by planning for declining consumption and accumulation wealth from those that have more? <laughs> it's pretty provocative, isn't it? Well, uh, whether or not a democratic uh, system could ever produce such a, 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 a an outcome is highly unlikely, I think, because people won't vote necessarily to uh, give money away that they've, they've considered they've earned hard earned themselves, and that would apply properly to governments. But if the United Nations uh, perhaps can, and I know it doesn't really have that much carry that much weight, unfortunately. Look at, I mean, the limp uh, efforts it had in regard to the invasion of Russia and, and Ukraine. Um, but if they could put more pressure on individual governments, we have these conferences of the party to try and persuade people and, and governments to put more money and effort into. But I don't think democratic uh, processes are likely to result in that much change, certainly not the kind of change that you are th suggesting might be necessary, the paradigm shift. Um, but po the polluter should pay. Polluter should pay. I mean, that principle I think I like. And if uh, 
China, which is a major uh, polluter, and America. Per capita, America is the worst, by the way. I mean, China is the biggest um, producer of carbon dioxide globally by some margin, but that's, it has 1.3 billion people. If you look at what's happening in the United States, it's about three times per capita more. So there, that's where we should be looking to affect change. But do you think that the, that the democratic process in the United States is going to resolve that problem? It's not. I think the person who asked that question knew that that was going to be the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Doncs crec que podem donar la sessió per acabada agraint de nou al professor Medeus la seva intervenció. Moltes gràcies, professor Medeus. Crec que ens ha ajudat a situar-nos una mica millor la perspectiva aquesta de la Unió Geogràfica Internacional sobre la geografia de l'antropocè. Moltes gràcies. Gràcies.